Well, good morning, good people. Good to be together with you. I'm Pastor Kendall Stelter from Providence Valley and Grace Lutheran Church. And let me just express to you again our delight to be able to come into your homes and this time when it's difficult for us to, to be together, uh, we're delighted that we have these opportunities to still be the body of Christ as we gather for worship. So it's good to be uh, heard by you, and it's good to be seen by you, even though I can't see or hear you. We're happy to be able to come into your home via our radio broadcast or via our online uh, worship that we offer on our YouTube channel. So on behalf of all of us here at, at Grace Lutheran and Providence Valley Lutheran, may the peace and the hope of Christ be with you always. We want to give thanks for our radio broadcast this morning, sponsored by Lowell and LeVon Stelter in honor of their 12th wedding anniversary on uh, August 24th. So we're uh, just uh, delighted we know it's my dad, and so I, I, my dad listens to me uh, via uh, the, sometimes the radio even as he resides in Sioux Falls and, and his wife, uh, LaVon, uh, but I know that they gather uh, to worship uh, in their own congregation, and then I, I think they, they plug in this uh, service from time to time too. So happy anniversary, Dad and LaVon. Uh, we pray for uh, many more years of, of being blessed to be together and with health and happiness and joy. So uh, keep kissing. Our, our uh, announcements are, are our bulletin uh, announcements that we have for our in-person services given this morning in memory of Scott DeLong from his mother Kathy DeLong. So thank you for those uh, opportunities to assist us in our worship and the ministry that we do here at Grace and Providence Valley. Uh, for those of you who had an opportunity to fill out our fall worship survey, we want to give you thanks uh, uh, for that as well. If you are, were intending to do that and just forgot, you can still um, uh, plug in and answer those uh, three or four questions on that, that survey. You can access that on our website at Grace Lutheran Church, or you can stop by the office um, and, uh, and fill out a form too, and we'll be sure to use your input as we make decisions for this fall and what our worship life will look like and what our faith formation activities will look like here at Grace and then also at Providence Valley Lutheran Church. Well, with that, let's uh, begin our worship together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is from everlasting and whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. And then trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. We pray together. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. And now, beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Your sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
let us join together in our prayer of the day. Oh God, we thank you for your Son who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point to us the path of obedience and give us strength to follow your commands through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Kelly Wente is our reader this morning. The first reading is a reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, where the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at the great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Berezites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and then they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is the title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Be love, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come and with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, three years ago, a, a tired, dusty group of Christians from this area right in Dawson found themselves sitting in a circle at twilight in an old church fellowship hall on the south side of Chicago. We were there on our last night of our week-long mission trip, and we were gathered on this warm July night for an evening devotional to close our day and our time serving in places around the south side of Chicago. And, and prayers were, were said, and then the devotion leader instructed the adults to get into small groups so that we could wash uh, the, the feet of our teenagers. Well, this foot washing devotional totally caught me off guard. Of course, I knew the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet at the Last Supper, but I have never been a fan of this story because I have never been a fan of feet. My feet or your feet for that, that matter. I'm not a fan of feet even on a good day. But this discomfort multiplied exponentially at the thought of a dozen pair of dirty, sweaty, mission trip teenager feet in my hands. But I was their strong leader. I was their fearless pastor, willing to sacrifice my own personal space and safety and obviously hygiene to be a solid role model for them of the importance and the sacrifice of washing feet. So I didn't want to show my angst at touching or holding or cleaning or even smelling their dirty, stinky little feet. And on top of that, I was struck in that moment by our inequality. I mean, I was their pastor and they were young teenagers. I was the grown-up who was old enough, right, to wash their feet. But then one bold youth from the group said, well, Pastor Kendall, I'll wash your feet. And how could I let this teenager touch and clean my feet when I took off my shoes and my socks. The whole thing made me feel just so vulnerable. But we did it. And as we did it, as we washed one another's feet, I felt something powerful shift inside me, something that made me wonder if my discomfort or my vulnerability was the whole point. I have rarely felt more seen and connected to another person and to God than at this very moment and by this simple act of washing feet. Now, memories of this moment came flooding back to me as I read and as I sat with this morning's story from Moses and the burning bush. And if you had to name the weirdest thing about this story from Exodus, the obvious answer would have to be the fully inflamed shrubbery from where the voice of God speaks. 
But honestly, as I read and reread this text, that's not part of the story that tripped me up. Over and over again, I found my mind drifting back to this one verse. It is where God is speaking, where God says, Moses, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And even now, all these years after that foot washing in Chicago, I found myself thinking, well, why does it have to be feet after all? Why does it? And why does God require Moses to remove his sandals to approach this burning bush? Why does God require Moses to remove his sandals to stand on holy ground? Maybe it's just a matter of respect. Maybe it's just a matter of tradition or obedience. But I don't think so. Because it must have felt weird for Moses to stop in the face of that burning bush and toss off his sandals. To draw closer to the burning bush and to draw closer to that voice of God, feeling the grains of, of sand and rocky pebbles between his toes and that brush poking into the skin of his bare feet. To feel the heat from this fiery bush on the tips of his toes. It must have been disconcerting for Moses. It must have felt a little bit vulnerable for Moses. And so I'm left wondering once again in this story if maybe that vulnerability is the whole point. Because without his sandals on, Moses can't just be a bystander. Moses can't be just an unaffected onlooker to this bizarre, revelatory scene. He has to feel it. He has to feel it, and he has to see it. He has to feel the ground beneath him. He has to feel the sand and the rocky stones in between his toes and, and the bottom of his feet. And without his sandals, he can't make a quick escape either. If things get too weird or too comfortable, he doesn't have any shoes. He's barefoot and he's vulnerable standing on that holy ground. Moses, in other words, has to be all in, all of himself in on this event. He is fully bound up in the message and call that God has for him. Moses is in it all together. And Moses isn't alone in his exposed, vulnerable position. God is there. And God remarkably gets vulnerable too. Just a few verses after this command for Moses to remove his sandals, Moses drums up the courage to ask for God's name. And this was no small request. In his context, to have someone's true name was to have immense power over that person. This is the Old Testament understanding of names. And it is hard to imagine the omnipotent God of all creation giving a poor sheep herder such power. And yet God does. When Moses asks, God offers his name. God says, I am who I am. I am who I am, the very holy name of God. And so God comes to the place where God has also called Moses into shared vulnerability. And only then can God compel Moses to lead the Israelites to freedom. Only then can Moses fully see God as a God who can be trusted. One who really knows the suffering of God's people. And only then can Moses fully see the trouble his people are in and fully see his part in this story that God is calling him to. Only in vulnerability. Only in openness 
Only when Moses is at risk can Moses feel the full weight of his faith and what his faith calls him to do and where his faith calls him to go. I am wondering if it is not so much that Moses must remove his shoes and become vulnerable because he is on holy ground, but rather that vulnerability is shared between him and God, and that is what makes that ground holy. That is what makes Moses stand on holy ground, is that God and Moses are vulnerable together. We are often taught that vulnerability is weakness, that weakness is brokenness, and that brokenness is bad. And we are taught to value strength embodied in invincibility and power. But this story of Moses and the burning bush says otherwise. And it's hardly the only time in the Bible that God suggests another, even opposite way. Look at this Jesus, the divine human foot washer himself. Look at this Jesus, vulnerable in his relationships with, with others. Look at this Jesus, washing the dirty, cracked, world-weary feet of his followers. Look at this Jesus, trembling on the cross, bearing the pain of the world for all to see. And this Jesus, the resurrected one, who returns in body to his friends and lets his friends touch his open wounds. Vulnerability. This is Jesus showing us a different way, a way of vulnerability. So both Moses with the burning bush, and Jesus with his cross are called to vulnerability. And after watching the news these days, hearing reports of illness and sickness right here in our very community, it so often feels like we are on fire. It so often feels like the world is on fire, that our lives are on fire, like it is one great burning bush. You and I are like Moses. We're tiptoeing closer. We are unable to tear our eyes away from the strange, disturbing sight, be it our world or be it our own health, or be it our own relationship difficulties, we cannot turn away, we cannot ignore these things, we cannot shut our eyes and unmake these things, and we cannot simply walk up feet and heart and mind safely wrapped in insulation, unaffected by the heat or the rocky wilderness ground that we find ourselves on now. No, we, like Moses, we need to take off our shoes as well. We need to take off our shoes so that we can hear God speaking to us from these flames. Because God is speaking to us. God is speaking to us from these very flames. And God is calling us to remove the sandals from our feet, calling us to holy, barefoot vulnerability in these times. And this calling does not ask us to embrace vulnerability forced upon us by oppression or by the brokenness of this world, but we are called rather to a vulnerability that is willing and mutual. We are being called to be seen in all our weak and broken and beautiful humanity and in this to see others, 
to see others in their very brokenness, to see the way the world is breaking them and us and the way we are participating in it. To cry out and to ask why and to ask how long. Why is peace so impossible? We must ask the questions and feel the pain of others on our weary, dirty skin of our feet. Just not for other people somewhere else, but for us, for all of us. And then we must get really, really quiet. And then just listen. Listen. And then to go where God calls us to go. And it's a scary thing, you know, taking off one's sandals in a world like this, in a world where we currently live. It's a scary thing to see ourselves be truly vulnerable, to go all in. But this much we know, we are not alone. God is there to meet us. God is there to be seen and to be known and even to be named when we call on this God for encouragement and strength. We have God's name. I am who I am. And God offers to be vulnerable with us, to join us in that vulnerable place with the heat of our broken world singeing our toes and this God with us and this God for us all. And only there can we truly know what it is to be standing on holy ground. Amen.
So now with the whole church, let us confess our faith together using the words of our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And then we join together for the prayers of the church. Let us bow our heads in prayer together. As we gather separately and together in the spirit, let us pray for the needs of the world, responding to each petition with the words, hear our prayer. So caring for the church around the world, we pray for the health of all congregations during this difficult time. We pray for church leaders in congregations who are making important decisions about the well-being of their church. And seeing before us your good creation, O oh God, we thank you for the recent rains. We ask that you continue to bring favorable weather for our crops, that there might be an abundance for all people this fall. We pray for the lands that are dealing with oppressive heat, and we remember those places ravaged by storms and fires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And facing uh, so many international problems, we pray for the strengthening of democracies here in this country and around the world. We pray for peaceful resolutions to conflicts, for the people of Lebanon and Yemen, for researchers seeking a vaccine, for racial justice within our own nation, and for our legislators to assist all people in their decisions and for an ethical election campaign. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And surrounded by people with a great and hidden need, we pray for families frightened by the uncertain future. We pray for those who have lost their homes out west because of the fires. We pray for students uh, deprived of uh, education as they have known in the past and we pray that you would support them and encourage them and their teachers and professors and aware of all who are sick and suffering we pray for all who are facing the coronavirus we pray for those without medical care and we remember uh, before you Butch Anderson and Jim Anderson Sarah Anderson Olivia Baldwin Tom Beals, Todd and Arliss Buer, Gloria Berg, Ken Club, Jack Flayton, Carol Fliarty, Wilton and Madeline Gustafson, Monica Kennedy, Sharla Kruger, John Lund, Evelyn Lundgren, Brad Matson, Julie Muron, Jeff Moe, Jeannie Peterson, Christy Peterson Thomas, Pat Saltness, Mike Stungland, Lauren Thome, Joanne and Larry Trader, Bonnie Westfield, David Tollickson, Ames Wager, Deb Lewis, Doug Pearson, and Kenneth Paradis, Parody, and also for the families of Donna Wiedenbach and Sarah Sherb. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And confident of your love for us, we pray also for ourselves and any of our own needs that we have in this brief time of silence. For all these things and anything else that you see, most gracious God, we pray that you would provide it for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
We want to thank you for all of uh, your ways in which you support us here at Grace Lutheran in Providence Valley Lutheran Church. Uh, we want to uh, remind you that uh, you can drop off your offering in the church office if you still aren't comfortable for joining us in in-person worship. If you're uh, listening to us online or by the radio, you can uh, also just text your offering in as well. And um, all you need to do is to dial on your uh, smartphone, 1-800-675-7430, and uh, you can uh, type in your offering amount and it'll be sent uh, to us um, automatically. So uh, thank you for uh, your every generosity. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. see you again next week. Until then, stay safe and healthy. Thanks be to God.